Shipwreck, Part 1 It's 2017, right after James Comey's testimony before the Senate Intelligence Committee. We're somewhere in upstate New York, where a group of friends are gathering in a converted farmhouse for a weekend reunion. Oh my gosh, Jules, this place is so warm. What a relief. Hallie, what were you expecting? Wind whistling through cracks? No, you know, these old farmhouses and the boiler's old. No, the boiler's great. That's great. The boiler is great. Because I thought what happened was people bought places for the first time and didn't think about checking the boiler. The boiler's a disaster. It's a great boiler, practically brand new. You made sure it was a great boiler. It was just a great boiler. We lucked out. You did luck out. We lucked out. The foundation is good, too. Huh. What about the roof? Oh, the roof. It would have been nice to have known. You, boy. Andrew, they own a lake. You own an entire lake? Get out of town. (laughs) Pond. It's really more of a pond. A mini lake! How (laughs) old is this place? Oh, I'll check this out. 1776. No. Oh, 1776? No shit. Well, the kitchen, supposedly. I mean, you know, real estate agents. Kitchen's that door, right? Go for it. 1770s, definitely. This room is mid-1800s. Upstairs is the 1950s. Oh, really? I didn't realize that. The paneling? Oh, I thought it was something wonderful paneled over. Nope. I think I can sort of see the 1776. I mean, the kitchen ceiling is low. Exactly. The original floor back there is brick. Oh, are you going to... Uh, We've talked about it. Brick is a pain in the ass to clean, though. But you're going to take up the vinyl. For sure. Eventually. When Jamie is out of college. Hmm. Hmm. So are there beams or something under the tin? Beams? In 1776, this place was a shack. Okay, but Ali, Andrew, guess what, guess what, guess what? (laughs) What? Guess how many families? In the shack? Exciting. Twelve. Mm-mm. Four. Three. No, no, I mean over the the span, the generations. Oh, okay. Um, One. One? You mean... Yes, one family (sighs) here. Same name, whole time. Same name. Good at sons, I guess. That's amazing. Right? And sort of weird and sad that they had to go, or decided to go, or had to go. Do you know? It feels very sad. Or maybe it isn't sad at all. We know nothing about them. We totally asked. The seller was not forthcoming. Don't you feel sort of guilty? Oh my god, no, not at all. Or, uh, not really. Are you going to leave the farm stand up? Uh, we can't decide. No, probably it's misleading. Mm. People spot the structure, they slow down, they see that it's... Empty, bereft, a blasted hollow heath of a farm stand. And then in their hearts, they probably judge our worth as farmers, which is annoying. Mm. Mm. So we'll probably take it down. Uh But I have fantasies. But really... No, we'll probably take it down. Woo-wee! That's cold for you, right? That would be cold. (laughs) Oh, welcome, strangers. (laughs) Jim, Mayor, how was the birth? Long. Very long. Longer than it should have been. But everything worked out. You looked cheerful. Mother and child resting comfortably, as the saying goes. It was scary for a while, or I thought so. Megan, she's a slip of a thing. How much can the human frame bear? And tiny little Hannah, how much of this can she withstand? (laughs) But the doula was a very steady character. She said, sometimes it just takes a while, and sometimes it's just hard. They were champs, all of them. 
champs. You know what the doula said, which I thought was great? She said, your life is transforming. It shouldn't be easy. Mm. It shouldn't happen in a moment. Mm. Hmm. Anyway, we left all three of them flat on their backs mm-hmm. asleep. And, and a pot of soup on the stove and a casserole in the fridge. And Megan's mom will be there this afternoon. You two are extremely good friends, I must say. <laughs> the very best. And now would be a great time for a hot thing. A hot, warm, liquid thing. A uh, bourbon, do you? Uh, I was thinking of cocoa. A day like today cries out for a hot cocoa, No. I don't know that we have any tea. Coffee? Probably. Let us go take a look. Hon? Absolutely. fucking lootly. Luis making it out this time? Yes, yes, he swears he is. <laughs> Heard it before. Uh, I take cream, by the way, half an hour. The guy at the gas station said they were saying snow. That can't be right, can it? That's what they're saying, the people whose phones work. How can any snow come from a sky this bright, this blue, and this cold. Mayor, hello, lovely. Hi. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. I hear you've ushered a new citizen into this wicked world. We did it all ourselves. Oh, Megan helped a little. Did you give him her? Him? Her. They? Too soon to know. <laughs> Is there a name? Hannah. Did you give oh. Hannah a voter registration form? We thought let her dry off and turn 18 first. (laughs) Never too soon for good civic hygiene. By the time she's 18, will there still be voter registration forms? Mm. In historical movies about the early 21st century. If they're still voting. Right, right, if they're still voting. Oh, there will be some form of ratification, surely. All the countries vote now, all the best dictatorships. You would have mentioned it by now if he had resigned. We would have, yes. Uh, Megan requested a Trump-free birth process, and then after a certain point, obviously, we were all too absorbed to even think about it. Mm. We've just had a Trump-free 24, almost 24 hours. I haven't had a Trump-free 24 hours in, oh, I think it's been over a year. Oh, my God. Painful. Uh. I think that's true. (laughs) The miracle of new life. And fatigue. But we got in the car. Our brain snapped right back. The car radio is broken. So he hasn't resigned. But do we feel like this is finally it? We were going to ask the guy at the gas station. But then, you know, where are we exactly? This is a red county, right? A red zone. A red zone. (laughs) You didn't check your phone? No, because mine is, well, mine is home in a bowl of rice because never mind why. We're just praying to the rice gods. So... It feels like this is finally maybe it, right? Oh, oh. Mayor. What? That's 24 hours ago. What, the head of the FBI called the president Ex-head. of the United States a liar on national TV. Doesn't that mean anything anymore? Oh, you would think. Oh, did you get Lordy, I hope there are tapes? Yes, I loved <laughs> that. Lordy, all of Comey's, all that gosh gee whiz. Is that, to what degree is that calculated? I don't think it's calculated. I don't know that it's calculated, maybe cultivated. Mm -hmm. I mean, sure. A workplace persona. Very uber Boy Scoutish, which would make sense, the FBI. But I thought they went for something butcher and gruffer. I know, me too. He is just a bit of a funny one, but very sincere. Absolutely sincere, full of himself. Hmm. You're meeting with the president of the United States of America, who you know is a neophyte. For dinner. For dinner. In in that back office, like on a table set up in the back office, is there a tablecloth? Am I the only one who finds this romantic? It is a wooing occasion. Two men, a table, a tablecloth, the finest fare the White House has to offer. Do we know what they ate? Do we know what they ate? Do we? No. The lighting? We don't know the lighting. Comey would have mentioned the lighting if it was creepy. From across the room, I saw the president. Torchlight playing across his visage. And then the violins and the low rumble of the timpani. I screamed. I ran. 
But Comey knows the man is a political neophyte. Why should he when Trump starts making the, like, the gestures of trying to demolish the, the, the what do you call it, the separation of church and state of the executive branch and the, the checks and balances, mm-hmm. the... Principle of judicial independence. And, like, the rule of law, right? Yes. Like, right, the rule of law. A biggie. What is that thing, what is it you call it where you're supposed to... I mean, what is the thing where it's where you're sidestepping, where it's about you and not the the flag for which you stand, mm. or or the office which you serve? You know, when you just trammel that corruption. Oh yes, yes, corruption. That's it. You just think Comey would have he would have come a little forewarned and forearmed. Comey has a long-standing professional habit from dealing with fellow professionals. But shouldn't he be more pragmatic mentally? If he's head of the FBI, ex head of the FBI, if he's our top crime cop, shouldn't he be able to like size up personalities in a glance? Isn't that isn't that what they teach them in detecting school? Well, I don't know that he was ever a detective. I don't know. You guys, he was a lawyer. Obviously, all the best people are lawyers. Oh. You know, the law, the law, the law mm-hmm. of the land. This man knows the law of the land. Right. What does it mean? I mean, what does it mean when the head of the FBI can't sum a guy up? If he had just, in this firm way, explained, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. President, loyalty is a totally, totally reasonable thing to require of an employee in a private firm, but there are these long-standing, well-established historical reasons why my loyalty is to the office which I serve and to to, uh, founding fathers is probably going too far, but it's a great time to talk about the Constitution. Trump has probably picked up on the Constitution, but yeah, if he had, if he had just done it diplomatically, cunningly, using a knowledge of like human nature and psychological pressure points, like, like in those profiles the FBI uses. Been an adult about the situation. Kind of. Instead of a wounded adolescent. Doesn't it a bit in a way, I mean, doesn't it make Trump's point about like, about the government, the swamp, this circular stagnant pool of people who know what the form is, but don't necessarily know the function? Government professionals and what they know is how to govern professionally. But do they understand leadership? Aren't they all a bit castrated? Wait. It just seems like a lot of drama. (sighs) Trump doesn't know how these things work. He doesn't know that people in government believe in ethics. I think the problem, the real problem, is that James Comey cares. He reeks of caring. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he's up against a guy whose real strength is that he quite honestly could not give a fuck. If he cared so very, very much, then maybe we all could have been spared that Hillary Clinton email bullshit. I can be grateful for him in this moment and still think he's a fucker and say, you guys, he cost her the election, yo. But what is the point of this whole line of discussion? Apart from highlighting the fact that no one involved is perfect and the good guys are slipping and sliding all over the place in a way they don't do in the movies. And I don't know. I think all of his sainted auntly fuss budgetness is worth it in a way for that one moment of lordy, I hope there are tapes. All right. What if there wasn't any coffee, but there was instead? Hot cookies, folks. Hot chocolate chip cookies. Hot chocolate chip cookies. That would be most welcome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Give me, give me 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Oh, you mean not now. You mean in the future. No, no, Andrew. I'm going to make them. I'm going to make homemade... From scratch. (gasps) Yes. Hot dog. Well, let's just be honest. We're actually talking 40 minutes. Are you really hungry? Richard is doing the shot, but we must have crackers or something. Every moment we argue about this is a moment Jules is not in the kitchen making hot chocolate chip cookies. Summertime. Outdoors, a farmer appears. My son's big gun, the really big gun he pulled out when he was very angry and worked up, which was only a few times, I think, in his childhood. He was, on the whole, a pretty easygoing kid. You got me because you couldn't afford a white baby. (laughs) And... It was certainly true in that I think if we'd been easily able to adopt a white child, no big deal. That's the way we would have done it, just without thinking. No question. But that was going to be a long, involved process. And 
Yes, expensive. <laughs> and the social worker warned us that there would be a lot of prejudice against a farm family. That was a placement mothers tended to shy away from, I suppose, because they thought their child would grow up to be a hick, or they might have to do a lot of chores, which is funny because I grew up on a farm and I did have to do a lot of chores and I hated a lot of them. But overall, I thought a farm was a wonderful place to grow up. I thought everyone thought a farm was a wonderful place to grow up. In that time, what parents would say when something had to um, you know, happen to the family pet, they'd say, you know what, kids? Lassie is going to a farm. Farms are a form of heaven. Right? So, yes, getting a white child presented a difficulty. And like any difficulty, really, like any point where things don't fall smoothly into place. Well, what I always say is that you have to be grateful for that. That's the point where things get interesting. And you end up going about things in a different way. And there's... Well, often there's a value to that. My dad used to say, well, he didn't put it this way exactly. My dad wasn't one of those pithy, folksy farmers who don't say much, but when they do, it's um, like very quotable. Now, he was actually a talker, and if truth be told, pretty much a rambler. But something he did say, in essence was that if you can keep your head in a difficulty, there's always something valuable you can take from it. Something you wouldn't ever have stumbled on in the normal way of things. Sometimes it takes a crisis to reveal to us the very best way forward. So I guess we had our ears open in a different way. We were at a church supper, one of those potlucks around missionary work in Kenya, and there was a slideshow of an orphanage, and we sort of pricked up and were thinking, well, if there are orphans, I guess we figured, couldn't we siphon off one of those babies as it entered the pipeline? No, we didn't think about it in those terms, of course. I just put it that way now that international adoption is a sensitive topic. But, well, in the early 70s, bringing that child into a Western home with uh, running water and all the food, parents and love and opportunities, that just seemed like a win from every angle. Adopting an American black child, like an inner city black child. That wasn't somehow, I guess I would have said at the time that I thought that posed a lot of social problems. We just weren't in any realistic way equipped to handle. The Farmhouse. No, no, you've seen this cartoon. It's famous. It was in the New Yorker. It's there's this group of sheep, yeah. flock of sheep in a meadow, and mm -hmm. looming over the meadow is this enormous billboard. Or is it, is it like a big lawn sign? No, it's a billboard. Yes, it's a big yeah. billboard of a wolf in like a suit looking very sharp and very mm -hmm. confident. Um, the slogan underneath the wolf is, I am going to eat you. And the sheep are totally nodding happily and saying, wait, what is it? It is what it is? He tells it like it is. Right, right. He tells it like it is. <laughs> oh, damn. Damn, damn, damn. What? I, um, I dropped an egg. Yes. That's terrible. On the floor. I was, oh, I don't know, it slipped or something around. Do you need help cleaning it up? <laughs> no, no, it's an egg. I've cleaned it up, but that was my other egg. You can't make cookies with just one egg, not when you've put in as much butter and sugar as I have, so now there will be no cookies. I mean, not until Richard gets back. Oh, because... Because what you people don't realize is that baking is a science. No cookies for at least an hour, maybe two. I know, I had gotten everyone pretty worked up. You did. Do you have store button cookies? I do not. Richard is bringing coffee too, right? Yes, Richard will bring the coffee too. Tea? No. 
No, that's why we had a revolution. No more tea. Yes, yes. You know that production of Julius Caesar in the park? It's that Shakespeare in the park mm-hmm. thing. And the man who plays Julius Caesar has a weird orange blonde wig. Uh, and his wife has a Slavic accent. And in the end, he's assassinated oh, by a lot of brown people. And now corporate sponsors are withdrawing funding. And the guy who directed it was being interviewed by the Secret Service and the FBI. That's the last thing I heard. They think this play will incite hordes of brown people to assassinate Trump. With knives. <laughs> but that's a check off the box moment for the Secret Service. No, everyone knows that theater is powerless. Sure, but the funding loss is for real. Corporations aren't obliged to attach their name to controversy. Of course not, but it's just, it's the scampering, it's the immediate rats springing from a sinking, the level of panic that I object to. Where's the discussion? When did we decide as a collective that it was fine to skip over the discussion? It's not a nuanced statement. How much discussion do we really need? Wait, but Luis, isn't that a First Amendment, isn't there a First Amendment issue there? Not unless someone tries to shut down the production. Yeah, but isn't financial withdrawal a form of silencing? No, the First Amendment only protects your right to speak. You don't have a right to dodge criticism. Mm. If words can't have consequences, they're impotent. And then where are we? But Damn, much more fun when it happens to the other side. Fox News, mm-hmm. when all the advertisers pull out of the Bill O'Reilly show in a cascade. Oh, I enjoyed that. Fuck it yes. reminded me, it kind of reminded me of 89 when the wall fell. Who knew Bill O'Reilly could plummet? Who knew that wall could fall? Hmm. Wait, what did Bill O'Reilly do again? Molesting or propositioning with a power imbalance and quid pro quos? Was there actual sex? I'm so confused. The young people, I think the young people really are asking for permission before touching. I think they've internalized that. No. No, Mm. they Mm. really are. Why is it that I'm so disturbed by that? Okay, but is theater powerless? Maybe it's Shakespeare, which is powerless now. Isn't the whole point of Shakespeare? He's timeless. And doesn't that kind of mean he can't be like, Relevant to the now? I think they'd use a contemporary play, only there isn't one. There are so many contemporary plays. Not about this exact moment. Why don't we just give up and agree that plays are never going to be relevant or useful to the current moment? Plays are about the eternal moment, yes? Ooh, very grand. (laughs) Art needs time and space and reflection. We can all agree on that. Can we? I think we have to. Okay, but Shakespeare, okay, but no, no. Any artwork made with eternity in view is a horror show. Shakespeare's writing about the politics of his time, yes, but indirectly because of the censorship. I think it's the, I think the history plays are actually his contemporary plays, right? Isn't that where he was dropping in the, like, contemporary illusions, Mm. right? Mm. Do I actually know anything about Shakespeare? (laughs) No. We know that theater is powerless because we have Euripides. Oh, my God. We're talking about Euripides. I know. I never know who he is, and I'm very frightened and intimidated. Fine to pretend. I'm intrigued. Carry on. Euripides is the last of the great Greek playwrights, 5th century BC, the golden age of tragedy, and... Probably not a coincidence, the golden age of the Athenian democratic experiment. Mm -hmm. The audience is the entire voting population of Athens and all of the ruling class. Attendance is mandatory. It's a contemporary writer's dream of relevance. Mm. And these plays, these big flashy tragedies full of bloodshed and heartbreak circle around arguments which don't resolve. They are full of questions which can't be answered. There are no clear villains. There are no clear heroes. There are only humans floundering in the ongoing problem of human existence. Humans who attempt to do the right thing and who inevitably fail. These plays do not have a message. There is no clear takeaway. You don't leave these plays satisfied. You leave them feeling uneasy about who and what is right and wrong. And it is in the discussing these plays the day after, in hashing out the right and the wrong of it around the 5th century BC version of a water cooler, that we become a people who are not merely subjects of the law, but a people who interrogate and create the law. In other words, 
citizens. Mm. So Euripides hates the Peloponnesian War. The Peloponnesian War. Mm. Remind me. Mm. Happily. Athens versus Sparta. Democracy versus oligarchy. 30 years of war. At the beginning of which Athens has the upper hand, no question. Tons more hard and soft power. Clear advantage, which drips away steadily Hmm. as Athenian politicians scuffle with each other, leveraging the war, patriotism, piety, outrage to further their careers. While the nation crumbles slowly, imperceptibly under their feet. And there is Euripides in the middle of all of this, shouting straight into the eyeballs of the entire city. No one wins a war. Politicians are cynical. Our motives are suspect. (laughs) It doesn't matter. Athens is divided, and so it falls. The Spartan army marches in. And I'm going to take that on faith. I am haunted by this. Art cannot save us. Art isn't a call to arms. It's an elegy. But he had censorship, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, are any of those plays actually about the Peloponnesian War? They're about myths and things, right? The city understands him. Yeah, but maybe the myth part of it gave people some kind of weird mental deniability. Maybe if he could have just said, you guys... The Peloponnesian War. (laughs) But wait, if he has a message and it's clear, then it's, I mean, by your own logic, if he's not also presenting a robust pro-war message, then it's not going to be something you debate, right? Around the Mm. 5th century BC water cooler. And so therefore, if art is much less effective when it's clear, if the problem with political theater is too much clarity... I thought it was the puppets. Oh, the puppets. Oh. Puppets are great. Who's the puppet? You're the puppet. Maybe you have to be in the mood for puppets. Maybe when puppets first happened, people looked at them and were filled with wonderment and imagination and didn't know that these puppets were about to be connected with a very boringly explicit political message. <laughs> I think illusion is more powerful. That's what everyone wants to think because illusion is more elegant. Is that Richard? That would be Richard. Uh, oh, Richard! Richard. Hey, Richard. Hello. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, Luis, you made it. Richard, you were going to get the groceries. I was going to get the groceries, but I ran out of time, honey. And I figured since we were all going out for dinner tonight. We're not going out tonight. We're cooking in tonight. No, no, we're going out tonight. Well, now we're going out tonight, but no, tonight we're cooking in. Oh. Well, I guess we're going out. And now we don't have any eggs at all, and that was the last of the coffee. That was the last of the coffee? Yes. I thought we had that coffee in the freezer. I threw that out. You threw it out? Why did you throw it out if it was in the freezer? You can't leave coffee in the freezer forever. It's only like six months. And that's only if you don't care about coffee. We've only had this place six months. Well, we've had this place six months. What did you think would happen with breakfast? How did you think we'd do breakfast without eggs? I I, I didn't know this was an emergency list. I thought this was a normal list. These people are so tired, and they've been up all night birthing a baby, and we don't have coffee to give them, and it's kind of ridiculous. All right, all right. Well, um, should I go do a grocery shop? Obviously, you shouldn't go all the way back to do the grocery shop. That's ridiculous. Or I can go first thing tomorrow morning. But what if it snows? It's not going to snow. Why don't we all go to that great diner tomorrow morning? (gasps) Yes. Yes. Uh, Um, What great diner? uh, Just on the, you know, yonder as you approach. Martha's, didn't you say that was a great diner? Uh, no, no, not really. It looks great and old-timey and greasy and all, but... But we'll be together! That's what counts? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yes, that is, in fact, in theory, what counts. And after that, we'll cook for you like demons. Like demons? That sounds appetizing. I know. I can only think hunks of skull... A room next to the Oval Office. (laughs) 
I enter the room. The president is seated at solo table with a white tablecloth, his face only half illuminated by the candelabra, the glitter of crystal and silver, the torchlight, the voice from the shadows. Mr. Comey, won't you take a seat? The twinkling of the silver, the soaring of the violin, the torchlight, the, the strings, the timpani. I ran screaming. In my heart, in my soul, I ran screaming. In life, I remained. I stepped forward. I sat down. 